Since it's the centenary year of the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb, a landmark event in Egyptology and popular Egyptomania, expect a few videos on the subject this year, and we'll start with a common saying, follow the money. There are two names I grew up associating with the discovery of the tomb. Howard Carter probably gets a slightly longer video later on, but the other was Lord Carnarvon. I remember imagining the two as gentlemen adventurers, travelling the world with cane swords and service rifles, negotiating with local rulers the world over and solving the world's problems because when I was a child, that's what I thought the British Empire did. Simpler times. George Herbert, which was his human person name, was the Earl of Carnarvon. That's a noble title in England for those of you who never watched Downton Abbey. Although speaking of Downton Abbey, the Abbey itself was played by Highclere Castle, which was where Lord Carnarvon lived, and where his descendants live to this day. As well as being born with a title, though not the title he later inherited, honestly the whole thing is a mess, but never mind that, George had another stroke of good fortune. Or rather, he had a stroke of his wife's fortune. See, that sounded clever when I thought of it, but now I say it out loud, it doesn't sound monetizable. Ah oh well, neither am I. Anyway, his lady wife, Almina, though in theory the daughter of an English businessman, mysteriously received an income, dowry and inheritance from the Rothschild family, very likely because her biological father was Alfred de Rothschild. This mysterious wealth meant that she brought quite a lot to the table, by which I mean a dowry of half a million pounds, equivalent to over 40 million pounds today. This was quite a lot of spare cash, and is instrumental in Lord Carnarvon's Egyptological story. You see, Lord and Lady C spent quite some time in Egypt. After a car crash in Germany, Lord C's doctor advised that for the good of his ongoing health, he not spend winter in chilly Britain. As such, the Carnarvons began to winter in Egypt, where they developed a fascination for Egyptology. Though famous for the excavation of the Valley of Kings, Lord Carnarvon's career as a financier of archaeology began in Deir el-Bahri, and it was Howard Carter whom Carnarvon employed to supervise that project. Just before the onset of the First World War, Carnarvon was given the formal concession to head the digging of the Valley of Kings, again taking on Howard Carter as the supervisor in the field. We'll talk about why Carter was chosen in his own video. The dig in the valley resumed a few months before the end of the war, but it wasn't very successful. See, the whole point of the Valley of Kings was to make the tombs inaccessible, but this hadn't always worked. The effect of this was that any tombs found easily in 1917 will have been found easily before and therefore plundered. The tombs not yet found by ancient plunderers were, by definition, harder to find. So hard to find, in fact, that by 1922 Carnarvon was convinced it was no longer worth his time or money. But in November of that year, even as Lord Carnarvon was contemplating resigning his concession, he got a momentous telegram. At last we have made wonderful discovery in Valley, a magnificent tomb with seals intact, recovered same for your arrival, congratulations. Three weeks later, Lord C and his daughter Evelyn arrived in Egypt, and the very day after their arrival, Tutankhamun's tomb was opened. The excavation and cataloguing of the tomb took a while, and Carnarvon would return to Egypt one last time to attend the opening of the burial chamber itself. He wasn't to know it at the time, but Lord Carnarvon would not leave Egypt alive. The rich finds in Tutankhamun's tomb excited academia, the media, and the Egyptian authorities alike, and Carter and Carnarvon seemed to disagree on how to deal with it all, because in early 1923 they had an extended falling out. It was then that Carter made the fateful decision to forgive Lord Carnarvon, because he apologised. Carnarvon's extended stay in Egypt would be cut short when he died of septic pneumonia, having nicked a mosquito bite while shaving. Carnarvon's legacy was in part that his untimely death began rumours of a pharaoh's curse, as several people involved in the Tutankhamun excavation met strange ends. The rumours were started by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of all people, who quipped once that Tutankhamun's tomb must have been guarded by elemental spirits. Howard Carter was about as polite about that idea as it deserved. In truth, there was no curse inscribed in Tutankhamun's tomb to be activated by invading archaeologists, and Lord Carnarvon's lungs weren't at their best, so pneumonia was always on the cards whenever he got ill. The tomb's excavation continued, headed by Carter with the backing of the Egyptian government, and Lord Carnarvon's remains were returned to England, laid in a hilltop tomb. It is unknown to this day whether his wife paid to have it guarded by elemental spirits. Thanks for watching. Don't worry, the whole year won't be about Tutankhamun, just much of it. 
And don't forget to click that little thumb if you like the video, it helps my channel grow. And of course to subscribe if you want more Egyptology every single week. The ancient mystical guardians who shake their fists at archaeologists on my behalf are my backers at patreon.com slash armchairegypt, who have my thanks as always. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.